Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potts, your host, a visual arts teaching artist. so great talking with Nikki Brugnoli. We discussed how and why she made the shift from teaching at the university level to teaching high school and the value allowing her career dream to change brought to her life. She talked about how she balances teaching and family and art making and how her art practice is connected to every part of her life. She uses daily rituals to continue making throughout the busy times. Nikki Brugnoli received her BFA from Seton Hill University and her MFA from The Ohio State University. She currently teaches studio art at Flint Hill School in Oakton, Virginia, and serves on the Artist Advisory Committee for the International Arts and Artists Contemporary Art Center at Hillier in Washington, D.C. Previously, she served on the faculty at George Mason University. Nikki has taught at The Ohio State University, the Northern Virginia Community Colleges, and the Renaissance School in Charlottesville, Virginia. Nikki's work is included in many private collections across the United States and is featured in national academic and public institutions. Nikki is married to artist maker Josh Whipke, and they have one son, Finnegan, a crazy tabby cat, Augustus Ravioli, and a golden retriever, June. They started Silo Press, a small artist residency in their farmhouse in Warrington, Virginia, in 2017. In her recent two-person show with her husband, Josh Whipke, at Riverviews Art Space, both artists aim to share their experiences of loss, transformation, re-evaluation, and memory after being displaced from their home in 2015. Here is an excerpt of her statement. My work is an exploration into the transformative power of landscape, memory, time, and the ritual of daily observation through abstraction and the widening power of the horizon in its various forms. I seek to find mystery and presence through meticulous investigations of daily life, many of which are recorded digitally during my walks. My most recent investigations are rooted inside of making visible the moments hardest for me to capture. I regard them as the unknown, and they are found in the night and the mist. Wow. Nikki has such an incredible way with words. I found myself wanting to write down so many of her phrases. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Hi, Nikki Brugnoli. It's so great to have you on. Just want to welcome you. Well, thanks, Rebecca. It's um, really exciting to be a part of this new podcast that you're starting. And I'm just really looking forward to the conversation. Me too. So I like to start with just a little bit of background. How did you become an artist and a teacher? Did one come first? Just talk a little bit about your background. Okay. Well, I am, I like to, I think, proudly kind of call myself or refer to myself as a first generation college student. Ah. I grew up outside of Pittsburgh in a small mining town. And I was an athlete first and foremost, and I sort of did art in the closet, you know, like I was always really good at it. And I, I love to do it. But uh, being a soccer player was a much bigger, it was just much bigger in my world. It was something that my family could understand, not that they couldn't understand drawing, but mm-hmm. sports were, were the thing. And so I was very influenced by my high school art teacher, Mrs. Patrick, and she was a a really wonderful mentor. And her husband was my elementary art school teacher. And they were just really instrumental as I was growing up. And then when I went to college, I went, I don't think I would have gone if I didn't, if I wasn't offered a soccer scholarship. Mm. But in making my choice between the two schools that offered me scholarships to play soccer, I made my decision 100% based on the woman I met who would become my mentor in college. She was an artist. Mm -hmm. Uh, So when I went to Seton Hill University when I was 18, I just sort of learned to fall in love with 
art in a whole new way. And I started as art education because everybody always told me, like, you're going to be a teacher someday. Elementary ed was my major with a minor in art ed. So that got me into the art classes. And in my freshman year, my teachers, my professors were like, what are you doing going into, you know, education, you need to be doing a BFA, which of course, I had no idea what a BFA was. Uh I didn't know you could go to school to be an artist. Right. So I made that change in the first year. And the sort of the rest is history. I worked with some wonderful folks at Seton Hill who really directed me. And then I didn't know from that point on, I played soccer sort of begrudgingly, like it was fun, but I just wanted to do a studio. And I I never looked back. Mm. I knew that I wanted to be a college professor. I wanted to be what my mentors were Uh in my eyes to other people. So that had always been my motivation, sort of since making that decision to make the change to a BFA, it was always going to be, I wanted to be a college professor. That was my number one dream or goal at the time. Uh And then how did you end up? So now you're teaching at the high school level, right? Yeah. 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 Very unexpected life change. You know, I went and I met my husband whenever I was a junior in college and Mm -hmm. sort of one thing led to another. And I guess you can't control your heart. I never thought that I would be as young as I was uh, when I got married, but he you know, open my eyes. He's also an artist Uh and just encouraged me to go wherever we needed to go or wherever I needed to go to find that next level. And I ended up going for one year to uh, Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania for my MFA and realized sort of early on that that wasn't the place where I was going to thrive and and make my best art. And then I went on to the Ohio State University, Uh where I learned a lot of really important and fundamental lessons in what having an or what being an artist really is and how to create not just my art practice but my whole life as a practice in making and that that changed everything it it changed everything about how I built a relationship around art making and life and it, it was at that point that those spheres sort of connected permanently and everything that I've sort of done in every area of my life feels like it's connected in one way or another to those spheres. Yeah. So yeah, we moved to Virginia because my husband's brother is a, a builder down here and they were doing custom furniture and cabinets. And, and when we moved to Virginia, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a community. And after about the first year of sort of transitioning out of grad school, I applied to just a handful of universities around here. I just sent, they weren't form applications but they were adjunct positions. And I got a call from George Mason University and I taught at George Mason for 10 years. Wow. Years as an adjunct. And then after five years, I was hired on full time as I had an admin position. And then I also continued to teach classes. Huh. It was full time. It was the first time I had health benefits. Prior to that, I was at the Northern Virginia Community Colleges where I would teach on Saturdays. And then I would teach two or more days a week at George Mason. And then for a year when my son Finnegan was a baby, I also took on a position at a private school, private high school in Charlottesville called the Renaissance School. So for a year, I had about a 500 mile commute with a baby. Uh, (sighs) And I think it was at that same time, at least when Finn was a baby, I was also working overnight stocking grocery shelves at a Harris Teeter because we needed health insurance. Uh, It was a a long process of trying to figure out how to make this dream work. Yeah. And what sustained me was was my my students. I love being in that environment. I love being in higher ed. I love, you know, thinking and asking questions and just being in that space. And, you know, I was fortunate that I really got, I got to work with graduate students and they were sort of the bread and butter of what I did with my teaching there. Mm -hmm. And they taught me tremendous amount about myself. And then slowly, you know, I sort of tried to to build community with a lot of those folks at Mason. And that became sort of the core of my community in DC. We live an hour outside of DC. Yeah. So it took some time with a child and a partner and living an hour away from where everything's happening to make all those spheres work. But slowly, you know, I started getting involved in getting shows, being invited to be part of group shows. And so I, I lived that dream for 10 years, but, you know, and applied for full-time jobs and would make it, you know, high, high up through the interview process or would have conversations and then nothing happened. Right. And eventually it just got 
really exhausting to be working so many hours a week and really in the end not doing what I wanted to be doing, which was full-time teaching. I've never been able to throw all of my energy into that. And as an adjunct, if you've ever done it before, it's at times a very thankless job. Yeah. And, you know, the students have no idea what it means to be an adjunct or what you don't have in relation to full-time faculty. And we didn't have health insurance for so long. And it was just really difficult to sustain. And then I knew I needed to make a change. We were thinking about relocating back back to Pittsburgh for a teaching position that overnight went away. Uh. And this job that I'm currently doing now sort of came to me through a back door. You know, it was it was full time. It was full benefits. And they just asked for a cover letter and a resume. And I'm like, you know what, what do I have to lose by by sending this in? And the next day they called. Wow. And then a week or two weeks from then I was there at school giving, you know, an eight hour interview getting to know the community and learning about this whole new world that I never had any connection to. Yeah. A couple weeks later, I was offered the job and I'm just, you know, so grateful that I was willing to take a leap of faith because it's really different, but I feel really valued and and I like the work that I'm doing. So, you know, it's taken time to be okay with like the dream I had went away and it's, and it, it isn't what this is a new dream. And like Mm -hmm. holding on to the idea of a new dream is I think really important. And, you know, I'm young, so we we don't know what the dream will evolve into. Yeah. But for now, I'm I'm grateful that I took a leap of faith and I'm, you know, trying something new. But, you know, at the core of what I'm doing, nothing has changed in terms of what I'm teaching and how I'm teaching. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea of your dream evolving. I mean, it really it really does over the course of your life and it'll keep evolving. Right. Right. And, and, you know, one thing if I've learned anything in my life is when you have a plan, inevitably, that plan does not happen the way you do. Right. (laughs) And that's okay. You know, I've learned to be a much more flexible thinker and maker and, and human being sort of holding on to that realization that life can change at a moment's notice. Yeah. And even within artwork, I feel like when I have a really super clear idea of what I want to create, it doesn't work. (laughs) Like it never comes out the way I want it to. Right. And that's like, that's, I think that that whole idea is something I talk to my students about all the time. And it's, I call it sort of embracing failure, you know, or just sort Mm -hmm. of being okay with whatever happens or whatever the outcome is. I really, I love teaching on a platform of failure. And my kids are, you know, when, when they hear the word failure as these very, these kids are awesome and they're doing great work and they're very high achieving and they hear the word failure and it's automatically like a worst case scenario. So trying to shift their minds to think about failure as an opportunity is really one of the best challenges I have as a teacher. And I think that's a role that I'm really grateful that I get to play and sort of teasing out and playing with that idea of really the word failure, which in academia or in school, I think is a really scary thing for parents to hear, Mm -hmm. administrators to hear, kids to hear, but I like sit inside of it and I love it because you know I do it every single day. I do it as a parent, I do it as a teacher, I do it, you know, as a partner and Mm -hmm. what is to be gained from some something not working out the way we thought it would. You know, the best art I've ever made has happened because of an accident, right? Yeah. And then you learn from it. Right. Yeah. And how else? I mean, it seems like that might be just working with those students might be quite different from your work previously at the university level and the grad level. Mm-hmm. What are the biggest differences that you see there? So the, so one thing that challenged me the most when I started, uh, and if it's okay, I'm going to name the school where I teach. Yeah. I'm, I'm proud of where I teach. It's the Flint Hill School in uh, Oakton, Virginia. And, yeah. Um, and I can link to them in the show notes oh, and that, everything. That would be awesome. I am yeah. so proud of my school and what we're trying to accomplish. And so I'm happy to talk about the institution. Yeah. So the biggest thing was, you know, that I'm teaching high school students and they look exactly the same as college students for the most part. <laughs> right. So I really struggled to curve the content. You know, when I came in last year, I didn't know my kids. And a really cool thing about my program is I inherited a very strong program from my predecessor. She built a really good, strong, critical program. And so what I inherited mm-hmm. was really easy to work with. 
the challenge was figuring out how to make it my own. And I'm, you know, a year and a half, a little more than a year and a half into it. And I feel more and more confident every day that I'm, you know, that this program is becoming my own. Yeah. The cool thing about it is, you know, if we have kids who in their freshman year are thinking about art school or an art degree in college, we have a really clear track. So they would take art one in their freshman year, art two in their sophomore, art three in the junior, and portfolio art in the senior. So it's very specifically tracked for kids who think they want a life in art. Now, we also have, you know, ceramics program, just connected to the visual arts. But my colleague, Julia, has her own courses. And then Mm -hmm. uh, we have a digital program as well. So there's a lot that our kids can choose from, but the ones who think that they want to go to art school, you know, they're, they're in my room as freshmen. Right. And so the cool thing is that, you know, because of the, the sort of history of my program, I am able to do quite a lot with them. It's, it's very rigorous. It has some conceptual elements. I can build an art history. Uh, I can really make it whatever I want, but the biggest challenge was understanding the social emotional difference Mm -hmm. of a high school student to a college student. Right. It's huge. Even though they look like college students, they're not. Yeah. When I came in last year, I was like, the whole first unit is going to be devoted to the theme of identity, right? Well, that like opened a can of worms that I wasn't (laughs) prepared for. Right. You know, I learned what is appropriate (laughs) and maybe what needs to, you know, be softened a bit. Uh Now, I would like, that being said, I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't have changed what I did last year because I think I learned a lot from aiming really high and hard in terms of getting to know my kids. Yeah. My school is all about building relationships with our kids and with our families. And so there's a lot that I feel very fortunate. I get to work with them in a way, very Mm one-on-one, and it's all about the individual development. So some kids, you can, you can really push their hot buttons. And some of them, you know, you have to find really creative ways to pull the work out without opening too many doors for them to get lost in. Yeah. And that's really been probably one of the biggest learning curves I've had. But I feel like I'm, I'm making really good progress. And I have a lot of support and resources at the school. So it works. But the social emotional piece has definitely hands down been the hardest piece for me to adjust to. And then of course, the other piece is even though I was working full time when I was at Mason, I live an hour from school. I'm in Northern Virginia. The commute is insane. Yeah. Last year, I left every day at 5am. So I didn't have to sit in rush hour traffic. Right. And, um, I would get to school at six and I worked out for an hour every day in the gym. And then I would be ready to work with high school kids, which I joke that I needed that hour every day to be able to manage what was going to unfold in the day because it was just so different and it's so demanding. Mm -hmm. As a teacher, I think that's probably one of the biggest differences too I've experienced versus teaching at the university level. The level of attention, my attention that's required every day, all day is significantly higher. And it's five days a week, you know, from 7.30 in the morning until 4 p.m. Right. And I've got at least two hours of a commute built into it. And then my family. Yeah. So it, it's quite a lot. But this year, my son is in the lower school and he's thriving. So we actually yeah. get to commute together. We can HOV together and he's thriving. So as he has grown into the community, uh, him being a part of it makes me want to work so much harder every day to do well at my job. Because for your child to be sort of growing in this really positive, engaged environment, socially engaged environment. It's something I I want to keep working at really hard. Yeah. And then do you get to see him during the day if he's there sort of on the same campus? We have different campuses. Okay. So I drop him off in the morning and then I pick him up in the afternoon. And that I think works really, really well. Yeah. You know, he has his own space and we're all connected. We have the teachers in the lower school have some great apps where, you know, they send me updates of what he's doing, pictures and, you know, artwork that he's doing or writing that he's doing. So I feel very connected with him throughout the day. Yeah, that's amazing. Pretty awesome. And we've never in, you know, nine years tomorrow is his birthday and we've never had a schedule that's been the same. And there's a lot of power in having 
the same schedule as your child. Yeah. In terms of, like in everything, every, every way of thinking about my life, having the same schedule as him makes every day a lot more manageable to plan. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, my daughter will be starting kindergarten next year and I'm hoping that she'll be able to go to, I teach at two elementary schools. So I'm hoping she'll be able to go to one of them waiting to hear back about permitting. But oh, yeah, oh, that I'm, I'm excited so. for that. It's, a, it's really the best. It's yeah. totally the best. And I, I'm just, you know, that's just another reason to be grateful for taking the leap of faith. He's with me every day. Yeah. And I wanted, there's, I mean, so much that you've talked about. I wanted to circle back to a few things. Sure. One, we're kind of on that topic right now. Um, just how do you fit it all in? You're talking about how much it is just fitting in teaching and parenting, but then art making is a whole other career. You know, how do you fit in creating and then like the proposals and shipping and all of that stuff? Well, that's a uh, great question. And it's an evolving answer. But <laughs> right. But you know, I one thing that has worked well for me is creating daily practices of seeing the things that are around me. So my work is really all about my life. Yeah, has evolved. That's not what it always was. Uh, certainly, it you know, it wasn't ever about that until I had my son, mm -hmm. which shifted everything in my mind and in my body about what why I was making really with my schedule as hectic and full as it is. I am not an artist who gets to go into my studio every day. I could like there's nobody standing at the door upstairs in front of it and saying you can't go down here. It's really more about sort of self preservation. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that when I come into the studio ready to work, there's so much inside ready to come out because I've been incubating ideas. I've been reading books or listening to books or podcasts or yeah. the biggest thing for me that I do every single day that again, evolved. It was never a part of my practice was I take a photograph every day of, you know, whatever it is, it's really just about being in the moment and being present. Or if it's not a photograph, it's just, I just have certain ways of moving through the world that, you know, in the winter, every day I would get home at five and it would be dark, but I would get on my running gear and go and run, you know, certain mapped out spaces in my neighborhood. And that became a ritual, also part of the practice, right? So my practice as an artist is about, it's not just about what I do in my studio. It's not just about making a drawing or a screen printed image or an artist book, it is about sort of recognizing the things in my life and creating situations in my life and patterns in my life that support the making. So mm -hmm. I learned this in grad school, actually, when I was working with Anne Hamilton and her husband, Michael. Uh, yes. they were, it was so fundamentally essential to thinking about being an artist as more than just somebody who works in a studio. Mm -hmm. And everything that I learned from them was surrounding the idea, not of being an artist with capital A, I don't think, but it's about sustainability. And so one thing I learned was that learning how to make bread and the ritual of all of the parts of that process was a form of making. Yeah. Creating a garden, sitting down and having a cup of coffee by myself or with somebody that I really enjoyed talking to was part of my practice just moments of connection to something outside of myself was a part of my practice. So it's really mm -hmm. about building ideas about sustainability to kind of keep me going and also giving myself a tremendous amount of permission to not come to the studio uh, because I have a, uh, I put a lot of pressure on myself. I yell at my kids all the time about being perfectionist, but I am the worst. I am a total perfectionist. Uh, you know, I think, yeah. you know, like there's so, I put so much pressure on myself to be good at everything that I do. And you know, that's unrealistic as a parent. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, you can't be good at a because you've never done it before. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can't be good at it if you go out and practice, right? But here I am as a teacher and as a parent and as a citizen of the world, you know, thinking I need to be perfect at all of these things. And part of that I think comes from the community that I have built um, and become a part of in DC where everybody is an active artist, right? And mm -hmm. most of them are in academia. And academia, while you know, it's very demanding. It's a different kind of demanding. And part of what you're paid to do as an academic is to do your research, right? That's part of the job. 
that is not part of my job. Although I was hired because part of why I was hired is because I'm a working artist. I think that's really significant in the work that I do. But for the most part, to get back to like your original question, I think it's about finding and creating sustainable practices Mm -hmm. and knowing that my life There is no separation in anything that I have or that I do. All of those spheres are connected and all the lines are blurry. And that everything influences or affects something inside of that that larger sphere of my life. So if I can look at my practice as something that's malleable and flexible, it's, it's a little bit easier for me to maintain calling myself an artist too. And I also, I'm very serious about working. So you know, I spent I spent all year last school year making preparation work for the show that I just had in January of this year. Um, and I spent all summer just cranking out a huge new body of work that carried into the fall a little bit with making. And then my final work that I was able to get done for the show that opened in early January was done at the very, it was finished on New Year's Eve. Yeah, You know, so it's all about for me too, is I'm a horrible procrastinator. <laughs> And part of it is because I know that I'll pull anything out at the end. Yeah. Uh, so you know, trusting my own innate ability to get the job done and meet my deadlines. I, I'm good at that, but that's taken me a long time to kind of manage. There's a lot of moving parts and, and I have to stay very highly organized. Right. And that's part of it too, is the organization piece. Uh, I so relate to so much of this, that perfectionism, procrastination, mm-hmm. and then kind of necessity of being organized. I actually have a poster in my classroom that says perfect is the enemy of done. Oh, I love it. And yeah, I need one in my home studio too, because that's like a message I want to tell myself every day. Just finish it. It's okay if it's not quite perfect. Right. Yeah. It's so tricky though. It is hard. I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult to be okay with you know, what we are right now and what we have to bring to the table today. And, you know, an energy level today might be very dramatically different tomorrow. Uh And when I took this job, you know, I, I told my friend, my closest friends and my family members, like, I need your support this year or for two years, you know, I call them, I'm still in the transition, you know, I'm a year, more Mm -hmm. than a year and a half in, but I still consider what I'm doing the transition. Yeah. I'm like, I need you all to support me in not making art every day or just supporting me and like encouraging me to give myself permission to be okay with slowing down right now. Yeah. My attention really does have to shift into this role that I have that I've never done before. And I really care about my job and I really care about the kids that I serve uh, and that I'm teaching. And Mm -hmm. that takes a tremendous amount of my energy to be thinking about how to sustain what I'm doing at my school and how to do it really, really well. And so it's like I'm I'm on this tight wire, right, of knowing I can be flexible in the studio, knowing I don't really have to be there, but also wanting to build this program in a very specific vision that I hope to be really successful, inclusive, engaging, interesting, you know, all of the things that I think in my own practice is, you know, what I'm really trying to build in that space or, you know, the spaces that I occupy a space for curiosity and asking questions, Mm -hmm. putting those ideas before making art. You know, if you want to make art, you've got to be curious, right? You have to, what is the question of your work? If I'm dealing with juniors and seniors who are creating their first series of works, you know, my first question is to them, well, what's your question? What do you want to know? What do you want to learn? You know, if you can identify that question, then we know we, we have a direction to think about what your artwork is going to do this year or what, what you want to do or what materials you need, or, you know, do you want to deconstruct something? Do you want to, you know, whatever it might be, you know, starting with them finding a question to what they are curious about, I think is really essential. Yeah. At least it's essential to my uh, teaching philosophy. And do you feel like your teaching is also really informing your art making right now? I don't think that teaching is informing so much my art making because I have a pretty, I, I kind of know what I'm doing, right? I have a pattern. I have a way of working that makes sense for my schedule. Right. And you've been making sort of long before you were teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I have yeah. Been. And, and the work has 
like I said, the work has evolved, right? It, it didn't used to be about my life, mm-hmm. right? For a long time, you know, when I started, I was I was trained in undergrad as a classical portrait artist. I was oh, working wow. with this amazing painter, Phil Savato in Pittsburgh, that my art history professor, Maureen Vassat, you know, connect me with. And I mean, Phil is, he's extraordinary. He's an extraordinary painter. And I just wanted to learn how to paint portraits. I mean, I wanted to be so good at it. And I was getting, you know, commissions left and right from, you know, an admin at Seton Hill. And I did the president of the school. And it was very rewarding for me. But then when I met uh, Josh, he kind of flipped my head upside down (laughs) and, you know, challenged my content. To that point, he hadn't been fully challenged. You know, I was making portraits and I was good at them. But nobody really ever asked me, like, well, like, what is this about? Why are you making? It? Yeah, what does it mean? Yeah, what does it mean? And I didn't know what to say. And I and um, that also then challenged, you know, how I thought about where I was going to go to grad school and what mm-hmm. kind of work I needed making to get into certain places. Yeah. And so I started, you know, abstracting. And it was like I made a grid and within the grid were like very formal studies of my mouth, my nose and my eyes. But it was an abstraction because it wasn't the whole portrait, right? Right. And then you know, it continued to further abstract until my work became about non-objective work. Uh-huh. Although in grad school, I was doing performative installation based on a 40-hour work week because I was trying to make my work connect to my family's blue-collar history. Huh. Yeah. I left grad school and moved here and knew nobody, didn't have a community, didn't know what I was doing. I went back to making non-objective art again, paintings, because that was what I knew, right? I didn't have anybody to talk to to work about. And so I went back to the thing that I was familiar with. And then for years, you know, I was, hmm. I was making paintings. And then after I had my son, I like that didn't make any sense to me anymore. Hmm. The language that I had created to support the work that I was making felt empty. Huh. And yeah. so I started to, to sort of, sh- and you know, you devote, I devoted the first couple years of Finn's life to him. You know, I was teaching mm-hmm. at you know, two to three schools at a time. Um, That's when I was also working overnights at a grocery store. And every minute that I had with him, I spent with him. I was not, you know, and and him, his life was the most significant thing I've ever made and will ever make. Right. Right. And so allowing myself or challenging myself to think about making differently was also really important. And then, you know, I started this new trajectory by going back to doing self-portraits, you know, something I had done since I was 18 years old. Uh And then one thing led to another and I was really interested in the photographs, photographs that I was making, but I refused to call myself a photographer because I've never been technically trained, but I make photographs, right? And I don't think necessarily as photographs, I think of them as, as, you know, they're, they're compositions, they're drawings, it's about light, Uh you know, it's all the things that I understand and I can, I can capture it on this camera right now. Yeah. And then do you, like, I noticed I had written down a question to ask you about your process, because I noticed the photographic elements in there. But then do you alter those photos? Do you paint on them or draw on them? What is your process like? Well, so with the photos, I actually have, I've never really exhibited photographs, Mm -hmm. right? So a couple years ago, I guess it was in 2004. 15. I had all these photographs of this farm where we were living. We cut like very unexpectedly transplanted to this farm and it was rural and beautiful, but you know, we couldn't get high speed internet and we felt very isolated. Yeah. And we ended up there through, we lost our house. And so that was the only thing we could afford. And when we got there, we were like miserable and sad, Uh. grumpy and just devastated. And my grandmother had passed away at the same time that we were losing our house. So like everything that was stable in my life, the idea of home, which also related to my grandmother, all of that just sort of disappeared in an instant. And we were like really struggling. But we had this this child who was four years old, who needed us to be available yeah. and present and kind and thoughtful. And so I, we would go out It was more out of necessity of just getting out of the house that I, I didn't want to be in, mm-hmm. but we had this amazing landscape. And so I started photographing the landscape and I started, there was a silo on the farm that I couldn't stay away from. Yeah. That I loved to look at. 
inside and outside and, you know, have all this video footage of and just it was, all became about a sort of a study of light. Mm-hmm. And again, I was taking photographs and I knew I wanted to do something with them, but I didn't want it to be about the photograph. Mm-hmm. But I also couldn't afford because I mean, we lost everything when we lost the house. So I couldn't afford to pay for like large format prints. Mm -hmm. So I consulted with a friend of mine and colleague uh, from Mason, Helen Frederick, and said, well, what if I tried to turn these into silk screens? And, you know, we weren't sure if it was going to work, but another colleague, a uh, friend of mine, Christopher Carnabicus, who was running the print shop there and still is the director of the print studio, said, well, let, I'll help you. Let's let's figure it out. This was this very experimental. I'd never screen printed before. I didn't know. Like, I had not really ever print ma- like done printmaking. Yeah. And it was just this experimental process of turning a photograph by, you know, piecing it together into four smaller pieces to make one larger image. We had this this big image of the silo uh-huh. or a part of the silo. And we screen printed it onto the material that I like working on, which is mar- mylar. And I love it because it's semi-transparent. It's smooth like butter. Yeah. I've become an expert at the surface, right? And for me, teaching about process, it's all about find the thing that you can mine completely. You know, if I know a substrate, if I know a material, I know everything I can do with it, which also means I can know what, what I can't do with it. Right. So the more I know about a material, the better the work can be because I understand the limitations. So Again, photography in my work at first, it was just the screen printed image over or under sort of abstract color palettes that has evolved to now it's much more experimental. You know, the first, that first iteration for the first solo show I had, and it was in 2016 at the McLean Project for the Arts, I had a whole team of friends who are my devoted, like I have amazing friends and they're all people from Mason. The majority of them are graduate students that I work with, that, you know, graduated, but were printmakers. So they knew what to do. Right. And then it was the first time I've also ever collaborated on a project like that. So that team, uh, Christopher, Ann Smith, Marianne Epstein and Sarah Dolan uh, with Helen Frederick, they, they taught me how, how to make, how to do screen printing. And it has evolved tremendously. Now I like I'm taking the photos and I'm looking for certain elements. I ex- I have an exposure unit at home now. I have a dark room at home. I can do everything uh, in my studio. That's awesome. And I can do everything on my own, minus maybe some really big printing where I need you know Josh to come in and help me line things up. Right, like you physically need more hands. <laughs> I need another set of hands. Yeah. But we've created the studios. He has a studio. I have a studio. And then we have Silo Press upstairs. Yeah. That is, it, it can give me everything that I need right now. Is it? Is it everything I want? No. But it's not <laughs> functional for now. And so now the photographic screen printed images, they, they're just a part of the larger process. So oftentimes mm-hmm. I'll start by printing the work and then I just start drawing into it and just, almost obliterating the image and an effort to find a new image. So it's there, but all of the photographic images that I'm using are screen prints, unless I'm doing artist books. And the artist books are all, for the most part, they're almost all digital. And then I have combined uh, screen printed elements with the digital artist books too. Ah, I love hearing about that whole process. And just, I feel like printmaking is a really, like it's a community based art form. There's, you know, you talk about like the democratic methods, the democratic process of being able to repeat images and disseminate information where printmaking really like was mm-hmm. born. And I just love that idea of all these people coming together to help you figure it out. Right. And I was really uncomfortable in that space. Like that was me huh. into enormous discomfort because I'm a painter. And I think historically painters are very much shut me up in a room, let me do my thing and don't bother me because it's really private. Yeah. Right. And now yeah. that being said, as my practice, as this form that I'm developing and evolving has evolved, 
it has become more private again, which I think mm-hmm. I need that. Like I, I give myself every day, all day to other people. So when I'm yeah. thinking, I really want it to be a solitary investigation. And, you know, I like the process of discovery that I can have on my own. But I, I've also learned, I don't know how to do this. So I'm going to go to A, B or C to try to figure out how to do this. And for me, the most important consideration is cost. Yeah. Is just managing what can I do with the smallest amount amount of money that can come out of my pocket. Yeah. Often I have created an entire life on, you know, sort of maximizing the limitations of what we have. I think, I think we've done a really good job with that, but we're both artists, right? So that I think just artists forces you to think about extending what you have to the absolute limits all the time, but it works for us. So you know, we're finding, we're finding our way. Yeah. And does he also teach at all? Has he taught? He did. Uh, he thought when we first met, he was finishing his MFA at Penn State University uh-huh. and he was adjuncting and he just did not like it. Huh. He had a really hard time dealing with people who didn't care. And, you know, I think as an adjunct, it's not that you don't deal with that as a full-time faculty member or in any position. Like I have kids that don't care about what we're doing now, but yeah, it's a different way of relating. I think Josh just doesn't have the patience to deal with that. Uh-huh. And he's a solitary worker. You know, he's a furniture maker and a woodworker and a painter. And, you know, he paints on wood and copper flashing that's used in, you know, construction. So he's finding a way to connect those spheres too. Yeah, uh, He did. Teach, and I think through the years, sometimes I think he's regretted that he isn't still teaching because Josh is brilliant. And my kids, I brought him into school a couple times and they love him uh-huh. because he forces you to think in a way you don't typically think. Yeah. And it seems like he's done that for you as well a lot. He has. And he's uh, like the ultimate researcher. Uh huh. Right. I sometimes think combined, we would make the perfect professor because he <laughs> loves to research and love to teach. Yeah. I love to research too, but I mean, he are, we have just stacks of books everywhere in our house because he can't decide what he wants to learn about right now. So he's learning about all of those things at once, which is, I think, pretty fascinating. Our son is also adopting a similar pattern of stacking books everywhere. You know, and I think we all, I think all three of us in the house are simultaneously reading 10 different books. Huh, right. I think it's kind of a cool thing to think about. Yeah. And does your son also think about himself as an artist? Does he make art? Yeah, he's funny. He does. Yeah. He calls himself an artist. Yeah. I feel like it would be hard not to with both parents as artists. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, like I refuse and Josh and I have both kind of made a decision. We're not going to teach Finn how to draw, at least not until he's older. I mean, there's so many things I could like little tips and thinking about space or observation or paying attention. And I, I don't because we are, we love the drawings that he makes so much, but he doesn't have that the attention right now to sit down and work. He used to when he was little, but now he wants to be playing with his friends or he's obsessed with the, this toy called a Beyblade. Uh-huh. He's a collector. So, you know, Finn is an enormous collector. He's been collecting things since he was a baby. So I think that that idea of collecting or accumulating is going to show up someday creatively for him. But, you know, he's got a great mind. It's hard to know what he will end up doing or how he'll evolve, but I have a feeling he will end up doing something creative. Mm-hmm. He's a very creative out of the box thinker. Yeah. So, uh, but we, we limit very much our influence on the way he thinks and makes. Yeah. I wanted to circle back again to, you mentioned Silo Press, and I just wanted to see if you could talk more about what that is and how it came to be. So Silo Press is, you know, not happening fast enough in my mind. Uh huh. Fast forward just for a minute to, you know, one of the questions you asked was like, if you could have unlimited resources to do yes. one project, what would it be? Yes. And Silo Press would probably be the direction that I would go in because I have, there's a lot that I would like to do with it. It started in 2017 when we were at the farm and it, I can't remember if it started out of a larger project that didn't really get off the ground either with friends of ours, but it just, we had, we got this press Uh and I'm like, we gotta, we gotta do something with this. And we've always wanted a press and we had this great silo on the farm. So the, the name came right away. Yeah. The whole idea was really to get our friends in the city to have a reason or excuse to come to the country. Yeah. Uh, I feel very isolated 
from my community. Mm -hmm. And I've grown more isolated since I started teaching at Flint Hill, just because I don't have enough energy to go after school into the city anymore. And now, especially that Finn's with me, we go straight home. Right. I used to teach at Mason, figure out the openings, go into DC, meet my friends, and then drive home at like midnight or one. Uh, right. Well, that's not sustainable. Yeah. I am up every day at five. Oof. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. So again, the idea of starting it was to create a space for our friends to come and work quietly. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in the foot of the Shenandoah Mountains. Warrington is a really quaint little town where, you know, I think the pace, it's Northern Virginia, right? But it's not totally Northern Virginia. The pace is a little different. And there are nooks, at least nooks that we've created for inquiry. Mm-hmm. And at the time when we started, it, it was on this farm that, you know, any time friends came to visit us, they just fell in love with it. Yeah, they, they would find excuses to come out there. So it started as a prompt for getting friends to come out. But the goal would be, you know, that I have four to five artists a year. Uh-huh. that write proposals about what they want to do here. Uh, we have, you know, screen printing accessibility. We have some printmaking presses upstairs. We have a fully functioning woodworking shop. Yeah. Studio. So there's a lot that we have in this space. And it would be my dream that, you know, we get proposals and five artists and they don't have to just be DC artists. Mm-hmm. They can be, you know, anyone from anywhere you know, that wants to come and be in another space for a period of time. Yeah. You know, we have visions for like what we want the guest bedroom to look like. So it's like a resource space, another library. Um, So there's sort of places for inquiry everywhere in our house, which, Mm -hmm. you know, I really think of our house as a maker space where, you know, each room can be activated. Yeah. I think of Finn and all of his friends and they're all like, you know, they go from one house as a swarm, you know, to another house. Uh And I'm pretty sure only house in our neighborhood that doesn't have like a a game room because it's a studio like every right essential living space is a studio space right I think someday he'll appreciate that a lot I don't think he doesn't appreciate it now but I need some peace in my mind so when they're all in the house I pretty much send them right back out because you know everything's everything's a space for sort of contemplation Uh or it is my dream for Silo Press, it would be that five artists at least come out a year. Yeah. And they can write, they can make art, they can make an artist book, they can just come and talk through ideas. You know, the space is there. Yeah. It's really finding the energy to then put into this next level. And I have some people that are lined up to come this year. It's really just about getting everybody on board. And now with this pandemic, you know, it, that actually, it drove me to think, like I was telling my friend Ann Smith the other day, like, I wish I could figure out a way during this pandemic to still open up Silo Press yeah, in a way that's socially responsible, because it could give a lot of people an opportunity just to think about things a little bit differently. So I don't know, like, that would be my dream if I could do anything. And then part two would be like, write a memoir because I've realized if anything from everything I've been through and all the art I've been making in the way that I sort of excavate my life's history Uh in my work that I actually have a lot to say yeah and I've lived through some pretty extraordinary things and so that's that's part of the dream too and I think someday maybe that dream can come true as well yeah I've noticed, well, I wanted to first say Silo Press is like an artist residency program, right? Right. I don't think we even mentioned those words, (laughs) but that sounds amazing. And then artist residency, visiting artists, just come on out and create space for making. Yeah. I've noticed in, in your work, at least on your website, the writing, like your writing is so poetic. When you do have a show, do you include the writing? Is that sort of part of it? Yes. And that starting in 2016 with my solo show, Mm -hmm. um, McLean Project for the Arts, the artist statements have evolved. The artist statements for exhibitions Uh have evolved into prose. Yeah. And that's very intentional. Yeah. Um, And I can't say like why it happened that way or how it happened that way. I think the writing process, though, is very significant for how I think and how I make my work. Yeah. And I think 
the work itself, even though at times it can be dark, it's still very poetic mm-hmm. and it's very much about a human impact, human experience. And the writing is an essential part of that. And oftentimes in my work, uh, when I'm working with text, the text from the writing finds its way into the work. Mm-hmm. It's very deliberate in the artist books that I make, but in some of the larger work where there's embedded text, it always is pulled from the writing that I'm doing for the statements for the shows. Oh, and it's so poetic. If you have not seen Nikki's website, if you're listening, you need to go check it out and read. Well, thanks, Rebecca. That means a lot to me. Yes. I have, I gotta say, I have some great friends who have helped me with my editing process through the years. And I don't think it would have happened in the same way if it weren't for their influence and uh, their guidance. Yeah. And I'm, I've been hesitating to even ask, but if you feel comfortable, would you want to talk at all about what happened, how you lost your house and kind of lost everything? Yeah, yeah sure. You know, I told the story and the exhibition that uh, just opened in January and ended in February. Mm-hmm. It's actually the first exhibition Josh and I've had together since 2006 when I was at Ohio State. And I have been making this work for a couple of years now. And I knew I I knew I wanted to propose an exhibition about the work, yeah, specifically about the loss of our house. And so I started writing the proposal and tying it all together. And then I asked Josh, like, it doesn't make sense for, for me to do this without you being a part of it. And he was 100% on board mm-hmm. and we make work that's really different, but it's pretty fascinating when it's together. It makes perfect sense. But so in two, we had been, when Finn was a baby, like an infant, Josh was working with a designer in town and she got guided us to this house that was affordable for us, but we knew we couldn't buy it outright. There was just too much going on, but we got into a situation where we were renting to own. And for four years, we we rented to own that house. And, you know, it was a 1950 Cape Cod uh, on a couple of acres that, uh, you know, when you looked out the back windows, it was a full mountain view. It was amazing. Uh, it's like a dream house. It was a dream house. And we slowly, you know, we gutted it to the studs uh, with wow. friends and family a lot of friends and families that gave up their weekends to come and mm-hmm. help us put this house back together from, you know, electrical wires to insulation, you know, you name it, new walls, everything, we did it. And Josh had a, a very serious hand accident Oof. in 2000. 14 now. And that was devastating for us. And it kind of set us back in terms of purchase. Mm -hmm. But in 2015, we were were finally sort of figured out our resources. I was full time at Mason. And, you know, we pulled the trigger, we presented the owners with a purchase contract. And the next day, we got a letter from their attorney saying, you know, we have no obligation to the whip keys, we're not selling them the house Uh. in 90 days a new place to live. Wow. My grandmother was, it was just a matter of time at that time. And, you know, we had, we didn't know what to do. You know, we exhausted all of our extra finances for our down payment on legal fees. And we're essentially advised, like, you could win if you go to court, but I can't guarantee it. So your best bet is just to move on. And I mean, I can't even begin to tell you what that experience was for us. And then that was in August. And then we were told we had until November to move out. My grandmother passed away in September. And so it was just really, really, really hard. Yeah. And the only thing we could afford, right? Because the property values around here are going through the roof. Right. And even rent, the only thing we could afford was this farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. So we purged a lot of stuff that we'd been holding on to, like wood that Josh had been collecting for years to build future dream places in our house. We just let it go, all of it. And we decreased scale a lot. And what we had, you know, we we took what we could take. I had been holding on to all of Finn's baby clothes. This is something I'll like just never remember. Because one, I didn't know if I ever would be able to, you know, if we would want to have more kids. But you, know, you carry around your baby's clothes. Yeah. And, uh, I remember going through the crawl space and pulling out all these bags of clothes and thinking, right, my favorite thing he wore as a baby were his white onesies. So for whatever reason, I grabbed all of the white onesies from the bags and everything else went to Goodwill. Mm-hmm. And in 2017, I think it was, or 2018, with the help of Helen Frederick, who's uh, she makes 
paper, among other things. Um, oh. She's been here in the D.C. area. She started a nonprofit art space called Pyramid Atlantic in the 80s. And George Mason has a paper mill. And with the help of some friends and graduate students, they taught me how to churn those onesies into fibers. And then oh. it ended up becoming a book, uh, an artist I made for Josh for Christmas. I think it was in 2018. And it was my way of finally like letting go of the house. Uh-huh. The whole book was about the house. And you know, every image was printed on Finn's onesies. Wow. Oh. And that became my great act of letting go. But it took years. And I can't even tell you the sadness that we experience as a family, that our families experience and our friends, because nobody knew what to do. Nobody could comfort us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the deepest sort of longing was for this, the idea of home. Right? And so that's when my work really, really started to shift into the present and into looking at and paying attention and finding ritual and daily activities like taking a walk. Yeah. And all of the work changed. Everything changed because one, it had to, and two, because I was changing. And if I couldn't force myself out of the way I was thinking and the way I was feeling, it wasn't helping anybody. And I started to get shows. I mean, people... People liked my work. It started, you know, I had the confidence for the first time in a long time to start sending out proposals. I got a show in Pittsburgh at the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts, which has been there forever and a place I've always dreamed of showing. And that really was through this period. I also, as my grandmother was dying, Ugh. I started to go back home mm-hmm. and I started to remember places I would go to when I was a kid that I hadn't thought about in years. Mm-hmm. And one place was a set of Coke ovens that Andrew Carnegie built in 18. 18- 1975 as an experimental coal production. And they only worked for about 25 years. And then they were abandoned. And, you know, I used to sneak across the highway as a kid and kind of explore those spaces, those those ovens, they're big beehive coke ovens. But through the work, I also was working with a really wonderful woman artist, healer, Elise Viarda uh, in DC. And through our, our work that we did, she led me to kind of remember these places. Yeah. And it was a way to kind of let like to deal with my grandmother being sick mm-hmm. and her loss was to go back and revisit the spaces. And um, I would go and stay with her and um, I would run these loops like I couldn't deal with it. It's also when I started running again and um, and I kind of mapped out my life growing up, which for the most part, I grew up inside of a five mile radius uh-huh. here. I drive 70 miles a day. Right. Like it's unthinkable to imagine life, you know, for my family when they hear about how far I drive. I'm like, well, I just do it every day because that's what we do here, you know. But growing up for most of my life, I I lived inside of five miles. Right. And so at the time where I was, you know, going through the loss of our home and adjusting and making new work, I also went and made a whole body of work about these ovens that I grew up in. And so there was also a really significant show that I had in. It was 2017 at the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts. Mm -hmm. And so the process of healing through the loss of my house was making art. Yeah. I don't know how I would have survived. I mean, I would have survived because I'm I'm a survivor, but making art became fundamental in a way it never had before. Uh And it changed my life. Losing my house changed my life. But I think maybe for the better. Mm -hmm. It was a hard, hard thing to arrive at. But when I learned to let it go, when I made that book, for Josh out of Finn's onesies. Yeah. That was like a really like cathartic letting go that gave me permission to be okay with my new life, uh, to be okay with, you know, I didn't take a leap of faith, right? I, I was just thrown. The, the rug was pulled out. And, and you had to land. And we had to land. And we landed together. Yeah. And I feel like that comes back to that idea of embracing failure, and looking at it as an opportunity. Yeah, I actually haven't thought about that before. Yeah, like I wrote down out of the loss of your dream house came this sort of dream show and this shift in your career where, you know, you started to get more recognition and more shows and just sort of creating new work. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't thought about it as earlier before, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah. It ties into the bigger very seamlessly. Yeah, amazing. And I love that idea of making the paper out of his onesies. That's 
as someone who has, you know, spent time in a paper studio and made paper, I'm trained as a printmaker. So I did a lot of paper making and printmaking and worked with Joan Hall, who if you don't know, you should look oh, her yeah. up. She's another amazing paper maker, printmaker, who I think now is in, I want to say Rhode Island. Yeah, I am. I am familiar. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. I think, you know, this is like the ultimate paper has memory. Yes. Oh. Right. And and now it, you know, exists as a, as a completely different kind of object, you know, that's sort of a, it's just an ode or an homage uh-huh. to, to the struggle and homage to, to the loss, but no, not sitting inside of that anymore. And that feels really amazing to be kind of liberated from that sadness. Yeah. Oh. And then again, like I keep writing down the words you say and then keep thinking back to your writing. I feel like it's all just so poetic. Thank you. Yes. I don't like it's a weird thing. You know, I, I like I was saying, I don't like to I don't call myself a photographer and I don't call myself a poet because I respect poets and photographers so much Mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm like, I'm a little bit old school and thinking I can't be, I can't call myself something that I haven't had the training to be. Right. Yeah. And because I put those professionals on such high pedestals. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm, I'm okay to nod to what they do. Um, But again, I I wouldn't call myself a poet. I just, that's a a form, right. It's another form of poetry. And so if I kind of think of it less about poetry and more about another another piece of art that I'm making, I think I can grapple with the the name yeah. a little bit more. But, you know, writing is a part of it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the other thing we learn when we go to art school is we learn how to write. We learn how to write about ourselves and our experiences. Yeah. And, you know, it took me a long time because in art school, I was learning about how to write about the work. And I, it wasn't until I became a much more confident adult that I could write about myself in the work. It's a hard thing to do. I think so. And it's like, it's hard because I really believe in the authenticity of it. And and if you're paying attention, you can tell what is authentic and what isn't. Uh Yeah. And I don't ever want to be accused of being inauthentic in the writing or in the making. So that's really significant to me. And, you know, I think it helps that I make the work for myself and not for others. You know, even when I have a show, I'm not thinking about like, oh, how how much can I make for this? Right. Like, it's never about that. You know, the work comes out of me. And if it sells, like, that's really awesome. But at the same time, like... Each one is this really significant, it comes out of me, right? It's like this thing that I'm burdened that I don't really want to put a price tag on either. Like, honestly, this work, most of the work I give to people that love the work. I want it to be somewhere where it's really going to be valued. And that, you know, I, I have a full-time job. You know, I don't, I don't rely on outside income, at least not in my life right now. I've never been able to do that. It's not, it's not predictable enough right. you know, for my, my monthly budget that I adhere to. If I sell, then that's great. I can make an extra credit card payment or I can buy this Mm -hmm. thing that we need at home for the studio or whatever. You know, it's it's not about that. It's about finding a way for my work to connect with somebody else. And I think that's a really cool thing that's happened through this whole loss process is everybody on the planet has experienced loss. Right. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small, sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's not. And so if you can create something that connects and can kind of open up the mm-hmm. heart and soul of somebody else, like, again, I don't make it for that. I make it because this is what I have to do. Yeah, it's a healing process. And it's just part of who you are. And it's, yeah, and it's real, right? It's real. Like it's my real, you know, push to come into the studio and to work and, you know, and I, and there's never really an outcome either, mm-hmm. which is the funny thing talking about like you have this idea in your head of what you, what you want it to look like you know that idea of perfectionism if I, I'm just going to keep working at it to get to this place I come down almost always with a blank it's blank right or there's a screen printed image that I then have to react to so it's all about co- like reaction yeah trusting myself and my process enough to turn that reaction or that image or just that white piece of mylar into something and they're not always successes for sure there's some pretty ugly work up there <laughs> if you want to call it I guess ugly isn't quite the right term but you know there are some things that I'm I'm very deeply connected to and some are it's the process you know, tell students all the time like you're going to be lucky to get two things out of 10 that you're really proud of. Right, exactly. It's about paying attention 
to the things that you are really proud of mm-hmm. and what are the successes in those pieces, but also what, what are the successes in things that aren't so good, the things that you're not excited to show off, but there's been some really important learning in. Right. Like what did you learn from those things that didn't work? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Shifting gears a little bit, do you have any tips that you would give to I guess I see two different sort of groups of people, artists who really want to get more into teaching or the flip side of this, which might be a little trickier, is like teachers who want to get more serious about art making. I think the biggest tip is like you you really have to want to do it because nobody's going to create the time. Uh, they might create resources, but they're not going to create time and they're not going to create energy. And if I learned anything from, you know, now teaching high school kids, it's like that time element and that energy element is really significant. If my desire to make isn't there, it's not going to be made. Yeah. So, you know, making sure that you want to do it. And it doesn't have to be like this deeply intense spiritual thing. You just have to want to make it right. And you got to all start Mm -hmm. somewhere in our process. For me too, if I don't make, I get like really anxious. So my anxiety my anxiety levels go up and I get moody and I get easily frustrate, frustrated. So, you know, I guess the biggest thing is if you think you want to do it, create a schedule or create a ritual where every day that becomes a part of it, whether it's taking a picture or drawing a line or put a big, huge blank piece of paper on your dining room wall, if that's yeah. the only space you have to work and you don't do it every day, you draw a single line, you know, start with some parameters or like I tell my students when they don't know what to do, I'm like, all right, well, let's, let's create a set of parameters, right? What can you do inside of those parameters? So I'm going to draw for 30 minutes and I'm going to have 25 vertical lines and 35 horizontal lines and, you know, create a set of rules. And with those rules, there can be some kind of making. It might not be the making that you're going to do next week. I think the biggest challenge when you're thinking about this is just Mm -hmm. getting started. So creating a situation where you're accountable to that process, I think is really important. Yeah. And to hold yourself accountable. Yeah. It's it's very hard. And again, like for me, it's taking a picture and, you know, and for me, a picture or a photograph is intentionally constructing a composition. Uh You know, light is a very active part of that process. So, you know, if I'm laying in bed and like the light is just right on my dog's head, I'm going to take a picture of yeah. my dog because I really love the light. You know, I might not use that picture of June on anything except for my own yeah. um, entertainment, but I had this moment where I saw the light just right yeah. and I wanted to capture it. And just, yeah, saving that moment, even if it's just for yourself. Yeah. I mean, uh, at the mm-hmm. end, that's what it's about. Yeah. It's about myself. It, nobody else is really gaining. You know, they might get some cool art in their house or art that they like, but nobody... Nobody is gaining anything from my drive to come down here except me. Yeah. You mentioned a while ago lessons that you learned in your MFA program about sort of creating a life as an artist. And I wanted to come back to those and see if there was something you would want to share there. Um, well, I think the biggest thing I was saying, I worked with Anne Hamilton and mm-hmm. I also had another amazing. Mentor. Uh, she and Michael were both mind bending yeah. people to be around. You know, before I went to Ohio State, I had done a research paper on Anne. And then when I found out that she taught at Ohio State, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And yes. the first day we show up for orientation and all 50 graduate students are there and all the faculty are there. And Anne comes walking in in her like all black <laughs> and her bicycle oh. helmet and stands oh. right next to me. And I mean, I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to throw up, you know, like, very <laughs> intense. Uh, you know, it was a ridiculous sort of stardom reaction to somebody who I just thought was amazing. And so it was a, it was actually a really tricky thing for me to navigate because I, you know, she was a star in my eyes and I didn't, I was young. I was the youngest person in my grad program. I was 23 yeah. and I didn't really know how to navigate my identity with my evolving identity as an artist with somebody who was so powerful in my mind. Yeah. I'll never forget like my my other mentor, Alison Crusetta, who was, she was a director of the foundations program at the time and my teaching mentor. And she said, I'll never forget, it was my last night in Columbus when we'd all gotten together to like have our final hang. Mm-hmm. She's like, don't ever give your power to anybody else. And that was, that was a lesson. What I, what I learned most significant about the kind of artist practice I have now is that it's really, it sits inside of sustainability, our ideas of surrounding sustainability, 
and being and sitting inside of your mm-hmm. own vulnerability. Those two ideas, sustainability and vulnerability, have probably been the most essential key pieces to my mm-hmm. teaching, especially to graduate students. But I, I've learned how to teach that mm-hmm. to high school students and those two ideas. And then as an artist, I'm like that it is okay. And I think impossible, it's impossible for me to separate the spheres. Uh-huh. So if I embrace that being a mom mm-hmm. and a partner, walking my dog, teaching and making art are all connected. Yeah. They're meaningful and intensely, beautifully connected. Then I can have balance. But it's when like one sphere gets more attention than the other that it gets kind of tricky. And oftentimes the art sphere is probably the smallest as in terms of like the active Mm -hmm. making art sphere. But I don't think my output shows that. I think my output is actually very high considering I don't come into my studio every day. Right. Because when I do get in here, I have an explosive mm-hmm. amount of work that I do. Uh, it's like I just have, I think, a very tremendous ability to not even control, but like to put my energy in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, and I can compartmentalize very, very well. And so when it's time to shift gears, you know, I can get, I can get Finn set up. So maybe he doesn't come down. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But you know, last night I was working at 11 o'clock on a, a new project and, you know, he, I think he's super scared about the virus. Which, yeah. you know, I have not been able to listen to NPR around him for weeks, mm. realistically, right? I mean, he's he's nine. He's got, yeah. a very, and he's got a very active imagination. So it was at 11 o'clock last night. He's like, Mom, can you come and put me to bed? Oh. And yeah, all right, I'm going to just stop. But when he was two years old, I was in the basement studio at Lee's Ridge, our old house. And Josh would be sleeping two, story, two floors up and Finn would be sleeping. And I'd be crazy working, covered in charcoal. <laughs> I'd turn around and Finn would be sitting in my work chair. Uh, Mom, when are you going to come to bed? When are you going to be done yeah. working so you can come to bed? And like, all right, done. Right. right? I'm going to wash my hands and we're going to transition into going to sleep. Yeah. So there's a meter there, mm-hmm. you know, and I think being a mom, while I keep that very separate from my what I do as an artist, mm-hmm. I think a buzzword right now is like the mother artist, yeah. right? I don't put myself in that category. Mm -hmm. I am one of those, but I don't, my work is not about Finn. It's not about being a mother, Mm -hmm. right? It's it's not, it's never been about that. Although parts of it are connected, but you know, he, he gives me reasons to kind of keep myself clear and in check. And I do like that idea of sort of embracing the whole self, the whole life that Mm -hmm. you are a mother, but it's not all of you just as you are an artist, but it's not, you know, taking over your entire life that you're still making room for all of these other things. And they're all sort of interconnected. Yeah. I mean, I think it goes back to compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never had the resources to be able to do certain things. Right. And I'm okay Mm -hmm. with that. So it's, it's made me and Josh, I think very creative in how we use our space how we've created a home, yeah. how we've grown and evolved as parents, how we work in our given careers, mm-hmm. the things that we value come back to us when we're in our spaces. But I think the key, for me at least, as a, a way to kind of be balanced in my thinking is, you know, I just have to keep everything, everything's got to be in check all the time. So that that works for me. Yeah. You know, being a parent is absolutely a part of my life as an artist, mm-hmm. but, you know, it, it's not the whole, it's not the whole package. Yeah which I, I'm grateful for. Yeah. You know, I think that's a lot of pressure I would be putting on Finn too. Right. I would say that everything was about him. Right. It's not. So that's part of my, that's, that's part of how I'm mining through the, mm-hmm. the artist motherhood thing too is, you know, it's separate. And I, and for me, it has to be separate. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I have, I've lately been sort of trying to stop compartmentalizing quite as much, like allow some of that into my work, Mm -hmm. because I've sort of forced my work to be very separate from all these other things, this, you know, experience as a mother experience as a woman, all of the things around those 
identities. So trying to like let those things become part of it if it fits. But yes, but still not making that the entire focus. That's tricky. Yeah, I mean, I think when Finn was littler, like, you know, I took a lot of pictures of Finn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so many. And I would paint yeah. his portraits and I've drawn him. And I love that. But that's that's always been a like a separate part of the making. Like even like I still do in portraits, uh-huh. but it's very separate from like, I don't tell people, you know, if I do them, it's because they know I can do them. And I'm like, all right, I'll create some time, I'll carve out some time and I'll do it. But I would never exhibit the portraits. Although I would probably think about exhibiting the self portraits that I did five years ago, because I think they're very significant. And they're very interesting, because it's not it's dealing with a lot of the inner complexities that I hadn't ever done. It was my first time working objectively for the first time in my adult making life was with those self portraits. So that was really significant. But yeah, it's an it's an interesting, it's an interesting process. Yeah. And just sort of starting to wrap up, I have a few more like get to know you questions. One, sure. what are you curious about right now? Could be anything doesn't have to be art related. Well, honestly, like I, I am curious about everything, like all the time. Finn turning nine tomorrow makes me very curious. You know, I'm curious about how's he growing? What is he interested in? I'm enormously curious about Uh the pandemic and how to deal with it. Yeah. What's the other side of it going to look like? You know, we have no idea what the timeline right. is. It's inspiring to make some new unexpected work that is not at all related to the new body of work I'm starting, but it's in itself its own body of work that's really, mm-hmm. I think, very significant. So I'm, I'm just really curious about many, many things. You saw my reading list or the podcast I listened to or the music I listened to. I think that'd be one way to see my levels of curiosity. Yeah, I'll have to, maybe you could email some of those and I can list them. That would be really cool. Oh yeah, I have, I have a list of them ready for you. So awesome, uh, yes. Or I can just like take some photos of stacks of books and albums and whatever. Uh, yes, I love that. Okay. Another one, just really fun. What's your go-to order at your favorite restaurant? Oh, I love uh, vegetable green curry from a good Thai restaurant. That's one of my faves. Mm, nice. Yeah. And is there anyone you'd like to give a shout out to or thank? Uh, sure. Well, I, I've talked a lot about my family. So I just want to thank Josh, Finnegan, June, and Gus. June is my dog and Gus is my cat. Uh, you know, they make my world go round here. And now that we're all quarantined, yeah, our togetherness and awareness of one another, I think is going to grow more significant, maybe now than ever. Right. And I mentioned a lot of good friends mm-hmm. that have been really helpful. So I hope they all heard their names yes. when they listened to them. And I really just want to thank my community at Flint Hill School. Mm-hmm. I have wonderful, wonderful colleagues in the fine arts department, the leadership at my school is really wonderful. They've been great guiding us as teachers and staff and our kids through this process pretty well. I'm actually on spring break. We have a two-week spring break. So spring break started on, I think, Friday the 13th at the end of the day. And so uh, we don't technically go back until the 30th, but, you know, we're preparing for distance learning. You know, I, I feel very fortunate at my school. We have the resources that our kids you know, have devices that they can take home. So I'm preparing for virtual digital learning, which I think, you know, look for the challenge as an, as an art teacher, I think it poses some challenges, but absolutely. I think this is going to be a really pretty amazing opportunity in my teaching Mm -hmm. to think about how I can keep my kids engaged and how I can make it, how hopefully I can make some of their work that they'll be doing in this last quarter about what their experience is. So I'm really challenging myself to be very deliberate in making this an opportunity to be to do some of my best teaching and project building. So I just want to thank everybody there because they've been they've been amazing. And Sarah Dolan was the artist and friend who connected me with uh, you and your podcast. So oh, I want to awesome. thank Sarah because she I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have known about this if it weren't for her. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And just thank you to you. Like it's been like awesome to talk about my practice and to talk about my teaching. I feel like when I left teaching at the university, I like I said, I, I wasn't sure I wasn't sure how to own this new profession. So this is very validating for me too. You know, there are others and you know, we're not alone and yeah. this is hard. 
and it's so different than anything I've ever done before, but it's so significant and important. And I think now more than ever, you know, these kids need outlets and they need to know how to be mm-hmm. critically, right. how to think about art as social practice. Mm-hmm. Um, these are things we're trying to teach them with, with making zines and artist books. You know, I want to propose a community garden to my school, you know, just different things to de-silo our program so we can think about Mm -hmm. how art is significant and active in all of our communities and that it's a cornerstone of our civilization. Yeah. I'm I'm just grateful to be where I am and to know that I have a lot of support and autonomy to do something pretty cool, I think. So and to my kids. I love my students. Uh, I can't mention any of them by name or they will be mad at me forever. out. So that's part, I think, of the package of being so close with your students and having an opportunity to teach the way I do. It's so directed that I really get to know every one of them. That's amazing. And, you know, when they work, they're working for me just as Mm -hmm. much as they're working for themselves. They want to learn and they want want to do a good job. And so I feel that from them. And so I just want to thank them for making this job really the most important thing I think I've ever done. And I Mm -hmm. feel like 10 years teaching at the university has been preparation for this job. Uh huh. I love that. Yeah. That's my shout out. Amazing. And where can our listeners connect with you online? So I have a website. It is www.nikkibrignoli.com. Mm-hmm. And then I also have an Instagram, which is private. But if you uh, add me, I will accept. Yeah. And it's private because it's really just about these daily photos of my family Mm -hmm. and about capturing light in a certain way. And so you see a lot of pictures of my son and my dog and my cat and the dirt and just the things I'm observing. And you might see that that I'm actually getting ready to, I'm starting a new series of work called Postcards from Home. Uh Uh-huh. And this is in addition to the new body of screen printed work I'm starting. That's very different and a departure from the more landscape work that I've been doing. This is dealing with stuff from home, from Pittsburgh, with family. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think they're really intense images, but something I'm ready to take on. Mm -hmm. But Postcards from Home is a new project that I'm really excited about. And every day I'm creating a digital postcard that I'm then altering and drawing on Mm. and sort of listing things on the back of that postcard, all significant in one way or another to the image on the front. And so my goal is through this entirety of the COVID-19 and our quarantine is to make one a day and to accumulate them and then to propose something surrounding this as an exhibition somewhere. And I've actually proposed it to my to leadership at school as a possible community project to get everybody in the community, parents, students, faculty, staff, if they want to make a postcard at home of what is happening at home or what they're observing, they can finish it with their list on the back of things that are connected to the image and then send it to me the next year or the summer. I would like to curate a an exhibition at school or to turn those postcards into an artist book for our school archives. Uh. Amazing. So that was a big project that I'm thinking about. And that I have to say is shout out to an amazing curator and art dealer, Ada Rose Bitterbaum, who when this whole thing came, like when this happened, when this March 16th and everything started shutting down, she sent out a call to a bunch of artists asking us all to send her a postcard. What, you know, it could be anything with a list of six things, any six things on the back. Huh. And that any money that she raises, each one for $20, and everything that she raises will go directly to the World Food Kitchen. Uh. So she inspired me to think about I did my postcard and I loved it. And it is sort of forced a transition for me out of school into studio, which has been a challenge with this break because the coronavirus has kind of taken over my body and mind. Mm -hmm. It's been hard to transition to being on a break and having the studio experience I'd hoped to have. Yeah. But the making of that first postcard was so inspiring that it's led me to think about this whole new series of postcards from home. Mm -hmm. So that's coming up in 2020. Awesome. So we'll keep an eye out for it. Thanks. Yeah. Well, this has been so much fun, Rebecca. Yes, thank you so much, Nikki. You're welcome. Thank you. Such a great conversation. I so related to her comment about motherhood changing everything. It completely halted me in my art practice. But then it was also what brought me back to art. Do any of you relate? I especially liked the idea of teaching on a platform of failure 
helping high achieving students learn to embrace failure and learn from it both in artwork and in life. I also love the photos she shared of her current inspiration. Check out the blog post to see photos of the books she's reading and podcasts and music she's listening to. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or Teaching Artist Podcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.